Let's take a look at the structures of the cell in a little bit more detail. The plasma membrane, I actually dedicate an entire lecture to mostly how the plasma membrane works and, and we the transport of molecules across that plasma membrane. So I'm going to stay very brief and talk about it in, with broad strokes today. The plasma membrane is what we call a selectively permeable barrier, which means it separates the contents of the extracellular space from the intracellular space. Molecules that get through the plasma membrane are said to be selective, and they can get through the plasma membrane either by directly tr passing through the phospholipid membranes into the intracellular space, or by crossing through uh, various different proteins, whether through a protein channel, as we see here, or through various other protein transporters. The phospholipid membrane is composed primarily of the uh, phospholipid bilayer, which has a hydrophilic surface. And so that hydrophilic surface is shown here. As I uh, highlight it, it's these phospholipid heads here. And then we actually can get into the uh, phospholipid heads on the intercellular surface as well. And you can see these are each of them, the phospholipid heads are actually hydrophilic. They love water. They interact with water. The uh, hydrophobic portion of the phospholipid membrane is found inside here. And these are composed of the, or these are hydrophobic because they contain these long hydrocarbon chains fatty acid chains, the phospholipids have their hydrophilic head and these fatty acid chains that are hydrophobic. So anything that's getting through the membrane directly needs to be able to interact with that hydrophobic layer. Proteins are an integral part of the phospholipid membrane and you can see these proteins here. Uh, many of them are embedded within the cell membrane and they have an extracellular uh, portion, an intercellular portion, and the uh, transmembrane portion as well. Some proteins are not actually embedded, but they are instead attached loosely to the plasma membrane as shown here, either on the intracellular or the extracellular side. In many cases, these proteins have um, carbohydrates attached to them. We have uh, out here, you can see I'm highlighting in green these carbohydrate structures and carbohydrates can bind directly to a lipid which would create what we call a glycolipid. They can bind, if you look at this here, this one is attached directly to a protein molecule, okay, and so we would call that a glycoprotein or um, a proteoglycan depending on um, their structure. And then we can see, you know, again, here's another example of that. The carbohydrates itself excel would be the glycocalx. Uh, these are the extracellular carbohydrates. You can see that direction, that definition is shown right here. Job of the car of plasma membrane, very simple. In very simple terms, it's going to physically isolate the intracellular space from the extracellular space, going to regulate exchange with the environment. Any sensors, you'll recall we talked a lot about these protein sensors. Those are frequently located in the plasma membrane, not always, but frequently. And then let me highlight this as well because this is going to be really important for you to understand and see. I want you to look at the cytoskeletal proteins shown here that I'm highlighting in pink. You'll notice that the cytoskeletal proteins are not exactly part of the, technically speaking, part of the plasma membrane, but do you see how they interact with the uh, phospholipids, I've, I apologize, with the proteins that are embedded in the membrane. And so they hook on, let me circle that so you can see that, they hook on to these proteins right here, and you can see another one right here where it's going to hook on to it. And this is critical in terms of providing that structural support. So it's the plasma membrane proteins together with anchored onto, hooked onto that uh, cytoskeletal proteins that provide the shape of the cell, the support of the cell, that gives the strength to the cell. We will come back to this in more detail. Let's take a look at that cytoskeleton.
So the cytoskeleton has three main components, microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. The two we will talk the most about are the microfilaments, which are primarily composed of actin. Do, do, do. Pin is not working. Come on, pin. Help me out here. Um, okay, we're going to just pretend. There we go. I'm going to pretend that I write actin. There we go, actin. Boop, boop. And the microtubules are primarily pr uh, composed of tubulin. Those are the two types of proteins that make up these two different filamental structures. Intermediate filaments, um, also very important in terms of the structure and shape, but we won't talk too much about them. Microfilaments are um, the smallest of the different cytoskeletal filaments, and they are found in abundance um, in the periphery. So as we look up here, so here in this microtubule here, I'm, I'm sorry, let me fix that. Sometimes my brain and my mouth do not cooperate with each other. All right, so right here in these microvilli, you can see the filaments there. Those are actually made of actin filaments. And then you can actually see some of these filaments that are going to run through what we call the terminal web right here. I also frequently refer to this as a belt, okay, so belt-like structure. Um, and that's going to give support to the cell. In fact, cells are often anchored to each other. Here's a, an anchoring point, and we'll get into that in more detail. Now, structure of actin is essentially, and please forgive my less than beautiful art, what we end up having is a essentially a glob, a globular protein, which means it's in a ball. And we call this globular protein, a single actin molecule is called G-actin. And when we look at how the protein is synthesized at the endoplasmic reticulum, synthesized by the ribosome at the endoplasmic reticulum, each individual G-actin would uh, be made by a ribosome and fold up in the endoplasmic reticulum to produce these these balls. Um, when the G-actin is assembled together, we get our filament strands. And importantly, we'll have one strand of the filament. And this is where my artwork is going to get really ugly. Sorry, guys. Do do do. Nobody told me I needed an art degree to teach. Um. So we get one strand of the filaments, and then we're actually going to get another um, that is going to essentially twine around, and we get this kind of this twined, intertwined molecule, which makes up our actin filaments. When the actin is twined together, we call it F-actin. So for uh, filamentous actin. Now these G protein, I'm sorry, these G actin molecules can assemble and disassemble very rapidly. And so the cytoskeleton is very dynamic. It's going to grow, it's going to shrink, depending on the needs of the cell at any given time. And so that's true with these G actin uh, binding together. They actually, again, thinking about molecular interactions, right? We have these favorable interactions between these two G, molecule, G actin molecules and then we have favorable interactions between the blue and the red uh, and those are going to favor these twining together but if we change conditions those interactions may not be quite as favorable and everything's going to fall apart and disassemble. Microvilli as I showed you from the previous slide they make up the, f the uh, their little projections, their little fingers that project into the extracellular space and their entire purpose is to increase surface area. It would help if I wrote that with a pen. Surface area. Okay. Microvilli don't wave, they don't move. They're simply these finger-like structures. They're kind of short and stubby little fingers. And in fact, sometimes we call this portion, you can see the electron micrograph here on the uh, right, we would actually sometimes call this the brush border because they look like the bristles of a brush. They're stiff, they're, they're just out there increasing that surface area. And you can see the micro, tube or micro filaments or the actin filaments that run through these microvilli here.
terminal web, as I've already mentioned, also made out of actin filaments and uh, providing, running through those cells to provide an anchoring point for a number of different organelles and structures, proteins, etc., as well as providing an anchoring point for attachments between cells. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Intermediate tubules, just very brief honorable mention, so to speak. We're going to look at those. These are the purple strands that you can see weaving throughout the cell on the left, I'm sorry, on the right here. And you can see those. And those are in between in terms of size. Okay, They are fairly strong and structurally uh, last well, provide good structural support. And so again, those intermediate filaments you can see crossing throughout the cell, providing this network uh, to hold things in place. And then microtubules. So microtubules are, if we look at them, they're built out of a, a, another globular-like structure. So here's our little globe-like structure. And what they do is they form this hollow tube when they bind together. Again, think back to those molecular interactions. Those interactions are favorable. And so this hollow tube, okay, as it assembles, again, is very dynamic. And these globular tubulin proteins will assemble together to form what essentially amounts to as a cylinder. Okay. And so that cylinder shape is larger, okay, so it's biggest, the biggest component of the cytoskeleton, and it is going to extend, you can see, let me highlight that here, um, we can see that microtubule, one is shown right there, as I highlight it in pink, here's another one here, you can see one little one here, and those microtubules are going to have a number of different very important functions. If we look at the function, one of the functions is involved in cell division. So if you remember your biology, you should have been introduced to mitosis. And so if we draw a little cell here that is in mitosis, and we're going to see our little chromosomes lined up in the center of that cell, okay? And those chromosomes line up in the center because they have a little area on there called the kinetic uh, four which attaches to the microtubules and the microtubules extend from these structures called centrosomes and Inside those centrosomes are these two cylinder-like structures made out of microtubules called the centro centrioles. And that's what you're actually seeing right here. Is these are the centrioles here. And those centrioles are made out of microtubules and they produce microtubules. And the microtubules grow out of the centrosome. There's two of them. And so the centrosome produces these microtubules that connect to the chromosomes. And then when those microtubules, remember I told you they're, they're very dynamic, when they start to retract, what they do is they rip those chromosomes apart and separate uh, the two different halves of the chromosome into two different cells. And so this is our centrosome and our cent centrioles. Without, wit without these, we could not have cell division. And in fact, there are a few cells in the body that do not actually divide. They don't contain centrioles. Red blood cells, which technically speaking are not actually cells because they're not alive. Um, more on that when we hit hematology. And then skeletal muscle cells, which do fit the uh, description of living cells. But in the adult, skeletal muscle cells typically do not divide, and so they do not go through mitosis. And we'll get a chance to talk about that more as well. One more function of the microtubules that I want to mention is movement. Microtubules form cilia and flagella. And the purpose of both of those are to, um, they move. They whip back and forth. The cilia whips like in an oar fashion. If you can imagine the oars of a boat as you're rowing a boat, 
um, if you've ever had that experience, okay? And so the cilia is going to whip back and forth to create movement. Now, if we're talking about a little protist swimming in the water, the cell will move. But in humans, our cells are anchored and they stay put. So the cell doesn't move. Instead, what moves is uh, substances that are on top of the cilia. They're trapped in mucus. There's a little layer of mucus that exists right under there. And so we'll go ahead, you know, here's my little layer of mucus that I'm going to dry right here. And substances trapped in the mucus or on top of the mucus will glide along as that cilia pushes it along. We see these types of uh, structures, cilia, in the respiratory system. And the reproductive system. Cilia are found in, at the opening of the fimbrae, if you remember the fallopian tubes. They're found at the opening of the fallopian tubes to sweep the ovum into the fallopian tubes once it's been released from the ovary and to sweep that downward toward the uterus. In uh, the respiratory tract, it's, these are found in the airways from the sinuses down through the airways into the lungs. Flagella, on the other hand, slightly different than cilia. There's really only one cell in the human body that has flagella, uh, and that's your sperm cell. Okay, and that has the flagella that actually rotates around, okay, so it spins and whips around and pro provides pr propulsion for the, um, the sperm. Um, certainly a lot of bacteria will have flagella and so forth, so it's a fairly common method for movement. It's just not one that we tend to employ in our cells very often except for the sperm.